Yes, sir. District one, vacant. District two, present. District three, here. District four, district four. District five, present. District six, present. District seven, here. District eight, here. District nine, district nine is present. District ten, absent. District eleven, district eleven. District 12, District 12, District 13, absent, District 14, District 14, place 15. Here. That's one, sir. Thank you very much. Good morning, Commissioner. Today is Thursday, March 23rd, 2023, 9, 11 a.m. And welcome to the Region of the Dallas City Planning Commission. Uh, Commissioner, as always, this is the time to ask questions of staff as we go through the cases. Uh, before we get started, uh, we have a, a very special guest right down there at the very end. Uh, Abraham uh, Moreno is a sophomore at Addison High School. Was recently featured in a story in D Magazine uh, about what uh, one person can do to change uh, the environment here at the school. Uh, very honored to have you here, sir. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we look forward to see what when you come on this side and you start wearing the suits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seat warm, ready for you. Commissioners, yeah. with that, we're going to go and get started uh, right down the line with the briefings. Uh, we'll begin with the full Dallas today. Thank you very much. Of course. I will share my screen. And we very quickly pass it off to the team. Um, but just for the record, the Mayberry Gilt is the one of the assistant directors of planning and urban design. Um, thank you all for having us today to talk about Forward Dallas. We're very excited to be at this point to talk to you where we are in the process, what we've done so far, and the work that we have upcoming. What I want to do is um, introduce our team. There are a lot of behind the scenes or up to this point have been mostly behind the scenes staff doing a lot of really great planning work on this and engagement work, data analysis. So I want to make sure that they're introduced and you know that you have questions you can specifically reach out to. But Lauren Zahu, who I think most of you know at this point is a project manager for Forward Dallas for the update. Um, Brian Price to my right. Uh, has been working a lot with the consultants on data analysis, really developing some of the themes that you're going to hear about today. And then behind me, and only behind me because we have a smaller table, but very much part of the process. Um, we have Shalom Johnson, who is our engagement specialist. Um, it's been amazing putting all of our you know events together and thinking about unique ways to touch, you know, to make touch points to the community. We have Patrick Glades, uh, who's really been taking on sort of the land use discussion and place types and knows Dallas inside and out and has, has really great insight into our future land use um, ideas for the plan and working with the consultant. As a shape has been amazing from our data perspective, our graphics. She's going to be helping us with you know, pulling the templates together and really taking a look at making sure that spatially and ge geographically we are hitting all the areas that we need to when we're going out and discussing this plan with folks um, and we also have the secretary of this morning our our girl of Castillo. he is our urban designer and one key piece of this plan is going to make sure that we have that nuanced guidance for some of our place types in our local and really looking at it through that lens to make sure that we are getting it right. And I'm missing everyone. I got everybody. Yes. And then there are much others who have been working with us. So we appreciate all the work from all the other departments. As you hear, we have been having a lot of conversations with the different departments to talk about the different themes and some of the initial recommendations on the plan. 
So it's been a very collaborative process, and I think part of the team at this point, I will pass it over to Brian. Andrea? <laughs> So as uh, Andrea just explained, uh, the purpose of this briefing is to provide an update uh, on the progress of the Forward Dallas Comprehensive Land Use Plan update, uh, or Forward Dallas update for short. Um, that's how I'll refer to it moving forward. Uh, so in general, we're going to cover a few different topics today. So that's going to include uh, a general overview of the Forward Dallas project and, and why we're doing it. We're going to talk a bit about the land use plan themes, which will, will guide and shape the development of the plan as well as its recommendations. We're going to talk a bit about the difference between land use and zoning. Uh, we're going to discuss the consultant place type map, which has been made available for public review. And then we're going to um, wrap up with a call to action, a request for input, and project steps. So, uh, in general, I'm going to start by talking about what is Forward Dallas, why are we updating the plan, and where are we in the process. So, there's a couple of uh, policy legal reasons why comprehensive planning is uh, is encouraged um, within um, within Texas cities and with the city of Dallas in particular. So, the Texas local government code calls for land use regulations to be adopted within the context of a comprehensive plan. And the city of Dallas charter also spells out the need for a comprehensive plan to develop uh, land use regulations and, and um, other, other policy elements related to development on the ground. So another reason why it's important that we take a look at our future land use at this moment is that um, the city of Dallas population uh, based on historic trends and projected growth is expected to continue um, its growth into the next 20, 30, 40 years. We're actually expected to grow by about 400,000 people by 2045. And uh, just for some context, that's that's roughly the size of Plano. So uh, we'll, we will be adding a lot of residents and there will be a need for a lot of housing and a lot of development. So it's crucial that we think about what kind of city do we want this to look like in the next 20 to 30 years. Another more, uh, another uh, very practical reason why the plan uh, needs to be updated at this point um, is that, uh, that in contrast to the original Forward Dallas 2006, um, 2006, it did have a future land use vision, but it was, uh, it, it involved fairly vague categories and um, imprecise location of where those should be applied. Um, but since then, we've uh, there's been a lot of hard work put into adopting several area plans around the city, and there's been a lot of good work to provide that detailed level of recommendation uh, for zoning and for development. But uh, it's important for Forward Dallas that we can provide some predictability and some consistency in how land use terms uh, are applied throughout the city. There's also a concern about equity because much of the city isn't currently covered by an area plan and doesn't have a lot of specific land use guidance. Uh, so what Forward Dallas will do will hopefully guide future development, create some predictability and consistency with how land use is and future land use and visions are uh, described in places around Dallas. The other big piece that we want to improve on from the 2006 Forward Dallas is our implementation plan. So uh, Forward Dallas 2006 did have implementation measures, but uh, it, it was somewhat of a, a long, uh, kind of wish list of items, and it wasn't specifically tied to um, accountability or timelines or funding sources. So we really want our implementation plan to uh, be very focused and practical and aligned with our interdepartmental partners. And we wanted to uh, have some accountability and some timeline associated with it. So uh, in addition to those reasons, uh, we've also had several very wonderful recently adopted city plans that have been spearheaded by other departments. So obviously there's CCAP and um, which our, our goal here is to align uh, CCAP and, and all these plans to some extent do call out forward balance specifically because land use tends to intersect uh, with these other policy areas. So with CCAP, we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and we want to address environmental justice concerns and we want to address 
air, water, and land pollution through our land use strategy and for do things like reducing the um, urban heat island effect. The mobility plan also calls out for uh, Forward Dallas to incentivize and encourage transit-oriented development. Um, and the racial equity plan also calls out um, identifying mixed-use land uses in historically advantaged communities to increase walkable and affordable housing. Uh, and in general, we're hoping to apply some of the metrics used in the racial equity plan in, in a variety of ways throughout the process. So equity is one of our core values here in Forward Dallas. Um, another plan not referenced here, but recently adopted is a housing policy, and we're already in conversation with housing and how we can align target areas and focusing, and also look at housing placement and urban design for our affordable housing. Uh, Forward Dallas is very much concerned about where we place our housing, what kind of housing is available? How do we preserve and protect neighborhoods as they grow and receive new housing? These are all important questions for us and for the housing policy as well. Um, and uh, we've had very productive conversations with these departments and are continuing to do that hard work of aligning ours with, uh, with theirs. Uh, a couple of other ways we want to improve uh, upon comprehensive planning as, as done in the past. Uh, traditionally, while inequalities uh, were, were referenced extensively in the original Forward Dallas document. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we want to make sure that the future land use map and the implementation plan provide much more specific concrete uh, methods uh, and metrics for addressing uh, issues of inequality within the city. Uh, we also, uh, through the combination of Forward Dallas and planning and urban design programs in general, we want to have a more clear and consistent process for neighborhood and area plans to be integrated within the, uh, the comprehensive plan framework and make that clear so that um, residents folks uh, know if, if they want to uh, work with the city in adopting location specific plans, we're going to encourage that and hopefully provide a clear framework by which that can take place. So where are we in the timeline? So uh, we've gone through uh, existing conditions analysis, initial community engagement, and now we are uh, moving past land use visioning and looking at preliminary place type map review. Um, so I think Oh. All right, you are good. Start again. All right. Uh, so I'll, I'll continue. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are uh, currently in the process of receiving feedback on our preliminary place type map, and we will go through several more iterations. 
So there will be multiple oppor multiple opportunities for additional feedback, both in specific locations as well as the place types we've developed to address uh, land use concerns. Uh, we'll, we'll also be doing some place type uh, testing through some uh, some scenario modeling to sort of calibrate some of the place types. Um, and, and so uh, then we move towards our draft plan development and review. Then we go through the um, the review and adoption uh, process through our committee, uh, through this body, CPC, and through city council. Um, so a bit of background on our, our timeline. So uh, I see we have uh, uh, Commissioner Rubin here, uh, who is the chair of our comprehensive land use plan committee. We have been meeting with this committee of CPC extensively for the past uh, several months. Um, this graphic just represents some of the key topics we have covered in detail with the committee. Uh, it's been a very uh, productive um, dialogue, I would say, over the last several months, um, and it's it's been a wonderful um, a wonderful group on the committee to provide excellent feedback every step of the way through the process. And uh, moving forward, the committee will continue to um, support this work as we continue to develop the plan, and then moving into uh, adoption, and then hopefully adoption and post adoption work on um, this committee, this, the, the club will continue to um, support um, and review uh, area neighborhood plans and um, any sort of updates or amendments to the comprehensive plan. Um, so this committee is working with us extensively um, every step of the process. Moving forward, we have some specific place type map workshops and working sessions with this committee. Um, to make sure that we continue to get detailed feedback uh, in every corner of the city um, in the different place types and recommendations that we're proposing. So now I'm going to get in a little bit to our land use plan themes. Uh, these are essentially some overarching values uh, that we have established based on extensive community input that are going to shape the development of the plan and its uh, and ultimately its recommendations. Uh, how did we arrive at these themes? Well, we uh, starting in 21, we began facilitating um, extensive workshops uh, with the community. During 2021, if we remember, we were still kind of wrapping up the, the heat of the pandemic. And so a lot of these initial meetings were online, uh, but we had a lot of open-ended conversations where we facilitated small group discussions. Um, so we really wanted to pay attention to the language that community residents were using. We didn't want to leave them with any particular phrase or idea. So we listened to the words as provided by the community. We analyzed those, we coded those, um, and then we came up with summaries of what we heard. We then continued the work through extensive surveying in 2022. And from that work, we developed six draft land use plan themes that we feel summarize the, the core of the input and the values received from our public input so far. So what you see to your left is a, uh, I would call it a bubble graphic, but they're squares. So um, we, I guess maybe square bubbles. Uh, and so um, uh, by color, you see some of the overarching um, combinations we've made of some of the phrases and words heard but sort of a representation of some of the key ideas we've heard from the community. So the right, you see some infographics about some of the numbers of our engagement to date, over 50 in-person events, um, hundreds of map comments, thousands of unique online users that have reviewed and contributed to the map, over a thousand in-person participants, and um, over 11,000 interactive web map visits. Uh, so what has the community said? So uh, as we're representing here uh, on the slide, we've taken, we've taken essentially hundreds of specific ideas and started to understand the relationship between the ideas and look to summarize in an authentic way what we've heard. And that leads to uh, some, uh, some core ideas that you see to the right. And those have eventually led to the six land use plan themes that you see on the screen now. Uh, let me discuss those briefly. We have environmental justice, housing accessibility, economic development and revitalization, urban design, TOD and connectivity, and rural and agricultural and greenfield areas. So uh, the environmental justice theme is designed to cover uh, environmental justice concerns and compatibilities between industrial use and residential, particularly in low-income communities of color. 
This seems also designed to address some of the specific CCAP goals and targets related to greenhouse gas emissions. We also want to find ways to improve the tree canopy coverage. We want to improve water and air quality and also uh, land quality as well. Um, so we're collaborating with OEQS extensively on this theme to address sustainability and environmental justice. Housing accessibility has to do with two main ideas. One is having the right type of housing in the right places. So how can we provide uh, affordable housing at different price points and different types of housing? And how do we place them in ways that are in relation to jobs and transit and amenities where possible? And then the second idea behind this theme is how do we mitigate displacements and help to stabilize neighborhoods? So we're already uh, in conversations with the housing department and their anti-displacement toolkit and really trying to think through how land use can be a, a component of this work. Uh, we have economic development and revitalization, with, which looks at major job centers and commercial corridors. And how can we continue to improve the qualities of place in some of these spaces that are major economic generators for the city? Urban design, which is both a theme and a core component of the plan. Uh, I would say that Forward Dallas is both a land use and urban design plan in general. So with urban design, we know that uh, we that the city has um, adopted and pursued multiple policies related to urban design. And so uh, that includes a complete street manual, um, as well as a couple of others. And so our idea, our idea here is to lay the foundation for citywide urban design principles that looks at the public spaces we develop, how our buildings relate to the streets, and what kinds of public spaces are we creating. We want to create some general principles that can then be applied so we can unify <laughs> these regulations and provide consistent feedback uh, not only through our uh, our urban design policies, but also through the comprehensive plan itself. How can we integrate good urban design within place types and make that more accessible to our decision makers and our staff as we uh, review development cases? TOD and connectivity has to do with encouraging transit-oriented development uh, and improving coordination between transportation and land use planning in general within the city. So how can we encourage land use policy and practice around not just our DART stations for rail, but for bike and trail and bus as well? So we want to consider transit oriented development as inclusive of multiple modes of transit. And we also want to align our planning with the transportation department and find ways uh, to align um, Place types in our urban design and street recommendations with those of the thoroughfare plan and um, other practices within the transportation department and with DART. And then rural and agricultural and greenfield areas. Uh, there, are, there are several areas in the city, mostly in the southern, uh, southeast, southwest portions of the city that are considered uh, rural and or agricultural uh, and undeveloped. So we really want to take an intentional look at these spaces and how they grow and develop over the next uh, several years. So how do we make sure there's the right type of housing? How do we maintain the rural uh, lifestyle as it's described by a lot of folks that live in those areas? How do we make sure the right amenities as well as environmental preservation takes place in an intentional manner uh, in these areas? So that's kind of a high level of some of the key ideas uh, from these themes. So I'm going to pivot a little bit uh, as we move into talking about the place type map itself. Uh, let me briefly just uh, describe some of the, the, the fundamental differences between land use and zoning because that has a lot of pertinence for the, the purpose of Forward Dallas. So in general, so on the left side, you have some land use, land use characteristics, and on the right, you have some zoning characteristics. So in general, land use is about general locations or places. And so that might be at the neighborhood scale, it might be at the corridor scale, but zoning is site specific. Zoning deals with specific parcels and parcel based regulations. Um, to go back to the left, land use is a flexible guide. So it's not legally binding in zoning and development review cases, uh, but we do want to provide uh, recommendations that generally reflect the community's vision for areas around the city. So it's designed to be flexible. Whereas in zoning, it's more about legal specifications uh, specific to a site. 
Um, lane use in general looks towards the future. So our lane use visioning and forward Dallas is about what do we want to see. Zoning is about what is required today. And uh, land use is about general intent. So general land uses, a list of land uses that might be appropriate in a location, physical characteristics, general densities uh, versus zoning, which is about specific requirements, as I mentioned earlier. So what are specific permitted uses? What are the min max, uh, minimum maximum structure size, required site design, et cetera? Uh, let me also differentiate three terms that we're going to be using uh, throughout the conversation. Uh, one is about existing land use versus future land use. So uh, we, we've been looking at some existing land uses to understand what is on the ground now. We also have future land use, which looks more at what is the ideal primary activities of land in these spaces in the future. And in particular, we know that in the city, there are a lot of areas in the city that are likely not to change much over the next 10 to 30 years, but there are some, some critical areas that we know are undergoing change in the future. So uh, it's important to us that we really identify those areas that are prone to significant change and try to have some impacts in a community conversation about how do we want these areas to change and how do we want them to look uh, moving into the future. And then we have place types, which we'll go into a bit of detail here in a few minutes, but it, it represents a vision um, of a mix of land uses in development character, urban design, and density. So place types, and there are a suite of them that we'll present in a minute, but it basically takes land uses and provides uh, a description for a place like a um, traditional residential neighborhood. What are the land uses that should be included in this kind of place. And again, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail here in a minute. And I'm going to head this off to Lawrence. Thank you so much. I'm going to do a time check. I'm going to have to do a mad dash for this last leg. Um, so let me talk through, I think Brian was thinking about a couple of things. I just wanted to kind of delve into what that means um, and kind of have an example, or have some example in terms of bring uh, that concept in the uh, So basically, a place that we're doing in, that Brian mentioned, a holistic, larger picture vision, um, sort of what a community uh, feels like for uh, random uh, mix of uses, design, function, form, intensity. Um, so this will represent just one part, so it's about the entirety of a particular neighborhood, district, community. We want to make sure that we kind of focus on that part of our conversations. So on the slide, um, just based on what Brian mentioned before, we had a lot of community engagement. Uh, so, talking about what are these initial, uh, what should the initial place types be? What are some of these characteristics and what are some of those major types of places that we see in the city? Uh, so, we started from a baseline, trying to understand what existed in the city now, what currently happened in the city, and then evolving and kind of develop what the future place types need to look like. So, the uh, idea is to kind of start with something that everybody was familiar with. And develop those place types um, in terms of what the vision of those communities would like to see in their area. So we're going to do we're going to go through an exercise of looking at a particular part of the city or example of the city, um, and kind of going going through what a place type looks like in that particular location. So we're going to use the traditional industrial place type as an example uh, for this conversation. And as you kind of notice, our city that some of y'all might be familiar with, I'm going to delve into what a place type is and what that looks like for this community. So if you look in this for the traditional community, what's made up of uh, this area, this place is mostly a residential um, land use. So we'll kind of see in yellow. Those are highlighted first. That's Dominant land use that we see, but as we keep going and looking at the other pockets, other parts of this community, um, you see with an orange, there could be mixed uses, um, either townhomes or smaller types of uh, mixed use developments that uh, most families see developments that occur in the city. Um, additionally, as we kind of go even further into the other types of uses, there could be specific uses that are part of this place that we're looking at. It. Um, if you keep going even further, uh, looking down at the corridor to the left is a green strip that's an open space open park that the community residents use and then lastly another one i want to look at too is uh, retail land uses so as we talk about place 
looking at the land uses that make up a particular place. So that includes uh, both family, uh, single family, open space, all those uh, land uses make up certain types of places in the city. And what we've done through since the engagement is try to catalog what those different types of places are in the city. So another thing that we've done too, as we look at those different types of places in the city, I uh, want to start to describe those texturally and also identify those in terms of those major land uses and uh, supporting land uses that are building up or talking about what these uh, uh, places are. So for this particular presentation that we have here, it's very rudimentary, doesn't delve into a lot of the text and the descriptions that we'll be uh, developing throughout the course of this project. But we're going to show an example of what that looks like. But this slide just shows generally what these place types are going to be um, having within their description to kind of help everybody know what's um, in, in those communities, those places. Um, in addition to just having text and graphics, we're going to show pictures and examples of the city that people can identify and understand at a base level uh, what these types of places um, are. We're going to show another slide of images that kind of just represents what um, as an example three is your commercial mixed use district could be. But at this stage, the, the name and the imagery are still playing with that, getting community feedback, and feedback from uh, this commission, the club, community members, we met with the neighborhood coalition to talk through what are these places, like what, what do they, what are they now, what do they want to be in the future, how do we name them? So it's going to be the process that we go through the next few months uh, through this process. So on the slide that we have here, this represents the, the first draft like site map uh, that we've developed and published online. So this map was published March 1st, and this represents the baseline in terms of what current existing um, land use policy, adopted land use policy says um, related to these places. So that's kind of one lens that we looked at with our consultant. They use that as a baseline in terms of what they were applying and developing for the site. <laughs> What we wanted to do is kind of have a baseline in terms of what does current policy say, and then have this map and other subsequent drafts built upon that with community engagement, other area plans, other uh, input that we're getting to kind of morph this to be exactly what the community, the city, um, and other stakeholders would like the vision uh, for this map to be moving forward. So, talking about the iterations and how we're going to be going through the different drafts um, during the next few months. So there's a staggered approach in terms of the comments and the feedback that we get versus what map gets published as a draft. So right now that we have um, on, online, we have the draft number one. Um, that includes, again, like I mentioned, baseline policy map in terms of what being one is in. Um, what we're planning on doing is every month, we would use engagement from the prior um, period, apply that to the, uh, the next um, subsequent draft or the upcoming draft. Um, as we kind of go through the process of, of this plan. And so right now we can still do a preliminary plan review. Um, and then by the end of the month, there will be another draft that gets released based on feedback from fall visiting session and early on this year. Uh, so so what? So we we talk about a lot of stuff, there was a bunch of jargon. What's the purpose and why are we, why are we actually here to have this conversation? Uh, so I want to talk about a few things with uh, the next few slides. How does this help the Bellevue Review? How does this help this committee, um, this commission, excuse me? And then how does this map, how does this process respond to community concerns? So the first thing we talk about the Bellevue Review, like Brian mentioned, as our team is going to keep um, kind of Iterating place types for a flexible development guide. Uh, they provide recommendations about the future, but they're not legally binding. Um, so the plan is going to be adopted as a guide, and zoning changes should fall in accordance of the plan. So I want to make sure that there's a difference between place types. We talked about lane use and zoning. This is setting up a guide for zoning changes that happen in the future and helping you and, and other bodies that kind of deal with. Building changes that understand what the community wants in their particular area or the future of the system. Oh, did I 
Talk about these. So, <laughs> so how does how does this respond to the community's concerns? Uh, two things that we're going to highlight here. Uh, there were a plethora of concerns we're going to look into to address that. So, one, place types are going to explicitly outline certain goals and tools to address certain land use compatibilities. Um, the EJ tools that we mentioned with Brian talking uh, OEQS, they have an EJ screening tool that they're developing. We're talking about how can we use that tool. And talk about land use and how can those two kind of work together to provide clear direction, delineation related to transition areas, agencies uh, with different types of places in the city. Uh, secondly, a uh, place like I like areas in the city that might need a, a city initiated rezoning criteria uh, based on potential uh, changes to future land use place or designation. So as we go through the the process of identifying different places in the city and communities want to kind of we're leading toward a change with a certain compatibility with the land use component side that needs to change. Uh, this process helps identify what those areas should be to get to that component of what the city does. There's clear guidance in terms of where, uh, which ones should be priority to have those land use changes. Uh, so what has changed since CLUB? And as Brian mentioned, we've had um, multiple meetings with CLUB, and what we want to do is show what was happening to the last meeting with CLUB, which was in uh, Valentine's Day. So two things, we want to talk through the uh, investigation of the place site descriptions, how we evolve and develop that further, we're going to talk about other engagements uh, we've had with uh, other stakeholders, our technical review committee, and even some members on this uh, We'll wait for this to show up if it's important. See that. All right. So previously we were showing an example of the region of uh, commercial lace type, you know, very basic kind of descriptions uh, related to like what it is, land uses. Um, but what it didn't delve into and what we're actually developing with all, the, all these other place types or more neat in terms of what are included in these place types, uh, the intent, the application in terms of how they uh, match with other place types and land uses, uh, thinking about the adjacencies, what, what should be done with certain place types or their other place types. So that's something that we're starting to flesh out and we're going to be having a lot of uh, workshops with our club and also having some one ones with you all related to what, what is that language, what should it say um, in terms of addressing some of those concerns. Additionally, as Ryan mentioned, those six themes that we have uh, kind of teased out and refined from the community engagement, uh, we want to then apply those themes to each of these place types. So certain place types might deal more with environmental justice, TOD, um, or housing. We want to show those connections to those themes and how these place types are trying to address those concerns or those topics that we've highlighted, the community highlighted, not us, the community highlighted um, from our initial meetings. In addition to, again, just to show the, kind of the development of these place types, there's gonna be a lot of text, we're not gonna delve into the text today, but just wanna give a quick uh, kind of synopsis of what we're developing back of house and what you all will be expecting to see as we develop this. So what's next? I want to get through two of them to help these kind of updates. Uh, I just want to talk about these. So three things I want to kind of bring up for this body. Um, I want you all to help us uh, to review and provide feedback related to the working uh, draft map that's online. Um, also to uh, our request, we have those maps also in, in our offices downstairs. We will print those out for you to make those reviews in person if, if requested. Uh, so we need your feedback to kind of refine and tweak and look at those uh, from your perspective. How can that help your work uh, moving forward? Um, this is the project team thing about any barrier to implementation. So as we move through this process, there's going to be a lot of hurdles that we might not know about. We want you to help us to figure what those are, what those look like, and just provide some feedback and direction related to that. And then help promote 
development of this plan of your networks. Uh, we know the importance of this plan. We haven't really had a, uh, a clear laid vision document um, that kind of reflect that actually can be updated to reflect the current needs of the city. I want to make sure that this map reflects what you all think it needs to make sense and make it reflect for your work and also also reflecting the community as for us. Yeah, I think the last graphic I'm going to talk about um, the next upcoming steps. So we just talked about the different updates we're going to be having to this map. Um, multiple drafts are upcoming, so I expect to see that. But also continue to engage in this and have it throughout the entirety of this process. Uh, for, so for however long we need to engage the community, we'll continue to do that. We'll continue to engage this body and other bodies. Uh, we have a club workshop next Tuesday, uh, so we'll just have a, a little bit more in-depth conversation about the descriptions and locations of these play sites and, and refining what that is. So just because we've shown you all the draft of those ideas and those thoughts, it's still being massaged and still being developed uh, throughout the course of this project. And the last thing we're kind of requesting uh, that we have, and we could have scheduled individual meetings with uh, members of this body just to talk through um, that particular place site map based on your districts and um, what you're familiar with. So we want to make sure that we provide an opportunity in person, virtual, whatever method that you think is best for you. We we'll to provide that opportunity uh, to have a conversation and refining and developing um, the tweaks of the maps. And that is it for our presentation. I think I tried to spread it as I could. Um, so we will open up the floor for conversation. I said I'll give it back to Andrew in case you have any last word that you missed. And then I just want to give some feedback for this body. Yeah, I think you guys did a great job covering everything. I planned on here should be how you'd like to proceed with question and answer, what kind of time we have. Um, we're right, so here to answer any questions or delve further into anything that we presented today. Questions, commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Mr. Chair, I thank you all for the great presentation. And I'd like to also know the staff has been great about outreach. We actually just had a meeting in my community this week. So it would be great to start having that engagement. A um, few questions, and I'm going to try to be brief, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to meet with you guys uh, separately as well, because these would likely be more in depth. Um, first question is, and you touched on this a little bit, but where you have existing zoning that may not match the existing zoning, use, how are you guys evaluating? Well, that is part of the discussion. So, we are, that's part of the input that we're taking, right? When we talk to people, where are the land use and zoning incompatibilities on the ground? A lot of it staff knows, we've heard it through the years. Uh, you all have seen case after case in certain areas where you know that the zoning may not have been updated in a, you know, in accordance either with the plan or really with what's going on on the ground. So, they're making a list of those areas and to determine you know how extensive that is and then thinking about a process and work program to start going through and looking at whether or not we need to rezone those. I, although I want to be clear that would be an entirely separate process. So I know there's concern about how zoning interfaces with this. If, even if the plan recommended something, we still have to go through an entirely separate process to rezone an area, which means all the public engagement, the discussion that goes into that. So I want I want to be clear about that too. That this plan does not rezone. It just may indicate some areas that we need to do a deeper dive from the zoning perspective to either update to or. Pursue what we haven't over the past, potentially in some areas. So, the, I think one of the things I saw in the urban design, which I think I understood, is going to really be fleshed out in the um, language behind the place type. So I think I kind of see how that works. But on transit oriented development, and when we think about the McCollum corridors, that was a 
component that was in the current public balance plan, but I don't see that necessarily here. Is that anything that's being evaluated? So I think, yes, so lens and corridors and how to interface it with uh, TOD, um, I see two things. So as we talk, I'm having a conversation in conversation in regard, um, how TOD was thought about well, years ago versus what it is now, I think those are kind of different comps that we have to kind of update in terms of the uh, methodology and thought process with O4 Dallas. So we actually use it as a baseline in terms of those themes that were actually still relevant uh, relative to what they're talking about, we kind of looked at those and analyzed those and kind of pushed and showed us to look at other stakeholders to see that are we still relevant? Do, for example, um, do parking rights still make sense? Like how, how can that be a TOD? How can we integrate that to the TOD conversation? So I think, yes, we have looked at all those themes and kind of, kind of match that to what the permit community is saying about those topics as well. So does that mean that the thought process is important? That would be whatever that site might be, would be assigned along that. Not necessarily, it could be. So it could be some corridor that have a particular play site. Uh, there should be some corridor that have a multiplicity of play sites. I think what we're going to be doing is thinking about an overlay or another layer from the burden of my perspective, but how do these corridors work in certain uh, play sites? So that's going to be another component you're going to see in the, the little um, you know, mashup that we have. How does urban design, how do those elements? To defining what those place sites look like and function. Okay. So it ideally a language within each of the place types, there's there's a call out specifically for how the place type would relate to a major corridor. So we're hoping that whatever the place type is, um, the themes that we selected, all six of them, will likely have some language or impact in all of the place types. So there, there are environmental justice concerns in multiple place types. Um, and similar to place types, we're hoping that we can integrate. Like if you're if you're in proximity to a dark station, there are some TOD guidelines we'd like to recommend. If you're along a major corridor, we'd like you to relate to it in this way. Um, we're also hoping through the economic development team to maybe partner with uh, economic development on commercial corridors because we know that's a big concern for residents around the city is revitalizing some of our corridors that exist throughout the city, not just the major employment centers, but you know those neighborhood level. Corridors that a lot of neighborhoods rely on. Are you using the lines of corridors? Just to kind of, kind of tease out your question a bit more. Are there certain like, uh, questions or issues or just like corridors and city that you think and are hoping that this could help address? I'll look forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> I will say to that, I will say to that too, the other section we didn't necessarily spend a lot of time on yet because this was a lot to digest. Um, is the implementation piece of it, and there being a resulting implementation matrix. So in that implementation, so you can go from the map to the place types, and then within each of the themes, there will be a certain amount of recommendations, and it may be calling out certain corridors for certain, you know, different interventions or different ideas within. So, so there's an opportunity to that in sort of the third tier of the plan. And, and with TOD in particular, you know, we, we have been speaking uh, with DART and Mobility already because DART is, has uh, put out an RFP for some of the land they own around their stations. Uh, we know that housing is also interested uh, in placing affordable housing around TOD areas. And so we know we want to address, we want to sort of understand all the possible TOD sites in the city and understand uh, which ones have which land use issues and have a proactive strategy for um, you know, fixing or refining zoning or land use around certain TODs. So we know there's a lot of interest across the board for TODs, not just with us, but with DART and with housing and likely with economic development as well. So we're hoping to pull those threads together because we know this is a really important issue for the city. And just two more, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, could you speak to how um, preservation or um, recognizing our historic resources that we have are integrated within the plan? I didn't see that come up. Right. So we didn't touch on the two things we didn't touch on was kind of rural, kind of the theme, kind of, kind of, kind of preservation of maintaining some of those uh, land uses. I really haven't had any um, kind of guidance. But also, too, there's, we talked about the building of initial play sites. Those things I've started with was on the ground now. And most, most of those owners want to talk about maintaining that character, uh, that feel in terms of their area. So in terms of like the sort of preservation, 
have meetings with the uh, heights related to what they want to see to maintain their areas. Uh, kind of talking about those kind of concerns related to how that affects the place types. So we've been having conversations with that. And we kind of maybe tease up some of these place types of teams kind of to highlight that more. Um, but that's something we, we have those conversations and kind of pull those out further. Well, I guess I think we're going to be more designated districts who have their zoning and ordinances. I'm talking about other areas, and this may potentially turn into some of our information that aren't traditionally thought of in terms of a historic district that want a historic district may not be appropriate, but the ability to bring forth those same types of information right. and help things to enhance their character and, and what they find significant in, their, in terms of their historic resources. Okay, so well, then I, I would just say that, again, the scale of this. I mean, that's going to have to be left up to the details of that, the historic preservation policy and updating that and where we're actually targeting that. There is certainly in some of the place types, we can put the residential place types, we can point to certain goals for historic preservation. Um, but, you know, the details of that are going to have to be yeah. And they're going to be used yeah. to say I didn't see that integration necessarily, so I'm just wondering if that was done. And I will follow up with this offline, but just one maybe observation is um, as you all are looking at this map, it looks like that some of our existing um, plan development districts, maybe some of our area plans, are, and I know this is a very granular detail, we're all going to know our own districts better, but how we um, really drill down into those details, and it sounds like. Urbanizing or that has an, uh, 
urban component. And then on um, as you drill down, we'll look at areas, am I correct? We'll look at areas of the city that can lend itself to more urban design opposed to um, suburban design or stay in rural or continuance with the rural flavor. So with that being said, in areas of the city that are extremely rural um, and has no infrastructure, I don't see where in the Fort Dallas or in, in, in the Fort Dallas plan that you guys briefed us on that there was any type of uh, consideration being given, and if I'm, not, if I'm wrong, please let me know, but, or if, if there is no uh, consideration given towards the requirement and the need for infrastructure in order to have the city to grow. I imagine that that, well, I don't even have to, <laughs> that will be part of sort of that rural living for rural flex as we're playing with potentially another place type in addition to what has already been presented, that would be part of the description of that place type of if we're going to do X, we need these kinds of infrastructure. We need this kind of infrastructure, either completely brand new because it's not there at all or upgrades to it in order to have this be a you know safe and quality place for people to live or to work. So that would be part of flesh out as, as in actually an example like this, where you see much more detail and we can hit on those topics within that place. And okay, and, and just to change direction for a sec for a sec for a second. Um there are areas of the city that border another city. I am the for Dallas that plan that you guys have said there is no mention and no indication that there is any collaboration with those uh, other cities to blend so that there may be the possibility for blending land use and and uh, Thank you. So that there could be some collaboration as to where we can fit mm -hmm. opposed to where we are butting heads with each other yeah. so that we can have a city that kind of works. Right. Yeah, and we have so, so part of it are the existing conditions report way back in the day when Say way back in the day, but when you know, initially started way back in the day of this project, um, one of the first things that we were asking is, What are our edge cities? Do they have land use plans? What are those land use plans saying? What are the zoning adjacent to us? So, that is part of our analysis because it doesn't, I mean, we don't have to stop there, right? You know, that we lead over and vice versa. So, um, that's certainly a consideration that we're looking at. Yes, I think. Related to the, those other ed cities, like these, for examples, like you know, Southern Lancaster, we actually know planners there. We talked about what's happening in Hampton. Uh, the, the Southern Inland Port is actually a part of the multiple city kind of look at what are those divisions. Well, so, for you exactly. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> the building doesn't stop at the city panel, it's a more regional type of affair. So, we're looking at how those cities are kind of taking to their own use as well. Um, that's a key to make sure that our um, plan jives with their plan and the pre kit that have all make sense together. So that's definitely a conversation we're having. Maybe one more question. Um, did I just forget? Um, I, I think I just forgot. So I don't know. What you uh, yes, my first question is about the granularity of the future land use. If you look at the vision illustration from Forward Dallas, if it were a painting, it would be in the Monet section. <laughs> and that was essentially some of that time. If you look at the zoning map, you can see by the 
Council Adams photograph, you could drill down and find out what this square foot was on. From your presentation, it seemed to me that you're going to be somewhere in between those extremes. And can you elaborate on, will it be site specific? And if not, how close to site specific will it be? Yeah, uh, so part of the, the big difference with, with place types and, and place types are, you know, we didn't invent this idea. They, they, they're starting to be used fairly commonly in comprehensive plans around the country. For, for a few reasons, and one of them is so you know, for Dallas original, it had building blocks, and so it, it wasn't specifically that this area is literally this land use, but but it was it was relatively uh, vague and imprecise, and it wasn't meant to be parcel specific. So while place types are in fact designed to be parcel specific, they function quite a bit different than say an old fashioned future land use map, which said literally this parcel needs to be this. That is, that's not what we're going for. The nature of place types is that you have a suite of potential land uses. And so while there's guidance to what primary uses should be located um, in an area, what supporting uses should exist in an area, it also provides guidance in the place type that specifies, you know, just because you're in this place type doesn't mean this one land use could be put anywhere. It's, we provide uh, guidance that says, um, you know, Land uses should relate in this way, or they should be placed in this way in relation to our infrastructure. And one thing that the those building blocks did actually, you know, it's kind of similar to the place types. Uh, the only thing that how the was actually how the was created from one to the other, that in between, the distinction between different blocks, I think that in between is a little bit difficult for planners to have to understand like, what exactly is added in this area. So all the place types are more specific. They do have a suite of different uses that could fit in that particular um, parcel of location. So it's still kind of trying to well, so provide a suite of different types of land uses that exist in place, but also provide a little bit more specificity um, for reviewers. This body is kind of going to say, okay, this is kind of the location and the type of place that we want to see moving forward. Well, let's, let's take a zoning case that we see fairly frequently. You've got some commercial, maybe on a, an arterial corner, and then you've got a vacant lot, and then you've got residential. And that vacant lot right now is on R75, and the neighbors say it should stay R75, and the commercial people say, no, it should be part of the commercial. Your land use map is going to have either a residential place type or a commercial place type on that parcel. And yes, and that, that place type, so it had. Including single family? Yes. So the family work is complete. So single family, commercial, the office, depends on what that place type uh, designation that the community wants that place to be. So yes. Okay. And I would just follow up on that good here to uh, the guidance of five. And then this example would be it says it's supposed to be this type of a type of place. And then provide some guidance to the community developer and so to say. Well, no, that type of place does not include a six story apartment building. It does include single family or corner retail, and that's where then the business fit in this context of that particular example. And, and it also um, it provides guidance in where the usage should be placed within a place site. So there's a lot of examples where um, you know you might allow some some condos or townhomes, but you want them on the edge of the neighborhood along the major corridor. Whereas interior of the neighborhood, you want to maintain that single family character. So even in like uh, like an urban mixed residential, which might include some commercial, it, it, we could specify in there that you know interior of the neighborhood needs to stay single family. But if you are um, if you are along the major quarter, that's where the mixed use sort of commercial takes place. Next question um, is ten years after plan adoption, and we have zoning days adoption. <laughs> and the neighborhood, whoever doesn't like what the future land use map calls for, and they say, We were never consulted. Will there be a record where we can go back and say, 
Well, I beg to differ with you. There were 12 community meetings that met with the X, Y, and Z groups and so on. Or alternatively, well, yeah, there was a meeting two miles away and there was an ice storm that day and two people showed up. So, you know, what Andrew kind of was talking about, some of the examples the other cities that you've been part of in terms of what the zoning change happens like that, and how land use component could be updated based on that. You know, let's talk about that, like how that could be amended without well, that process. Well, I think specifically that, yeah. yes, we will keep a record of engagement. And that's part of what we really try to focus on is various different ways and easy ways to access where the engagement was, how it happened. So that, I mean, that's one of the benefits of going web-based in a lot of these things is that it will carry over for years to come. Uh, but yes, we will document for those. I think final question, um, and it relates to the balance of citywide goals and policies and localized neighborhood-specific goals and objectives. Uh, let's take a couple of stable single family areas in my district, Lakewood and Forest Hills. Not asking you to comment specifically about those areas, but how are you balancing, let's say, the overriding goal of increasing the availability of housing with the maintenance of the stability of those existing areas? Right, so one of the things I'm still nothing is to do because I guess I can have a very difficult like uh, scenario is be able to understand from the data perspective. Um, if we go with X, Y, and Z place at this location, what does that mean from a, a TOD environmental adjusted et cetera? So having metrics to kind of help us with that determination of where we need to go from a particular place at the location. Um, because if it's going to be distributed into this body, it's going to be counted to help us to determine exactly, okay, this is actually what we'll want to adopt. Well, all we can do is provide recommendations based on data on the different options. So, what we want our consultant to do is provide different, um, more options related to the data to help with those specific land use kind of conflicts or discussions that we're having in certain certain looking you just mentioned um, in your district or others in other parts of the city where we're also looking at. Um, that's kind of how we want to kind of approach that conversation is using data to help, to help us figure out what does this draft needs to look like kind of moving forward. And then also in the future, if community vision change, having a mechanism to kind of update that uh, place on the and be on those priorities. And I'll also add that part of the purpose behind the place type suite, and the reason we have so many different residential place type categories is. We, we realize, you know, Dallas is a city with a lot of proud and wonderful traditional single family neighborhoods. And even within the context of meeting, they talk about density or regional housing. We realize that, you know, where density or housing takes place, you know, we don't need to disrupt traditional single family neighborhoods to do that. There's a lot of areas where growth can and should happen along the corridors and downtown and along transit stations. We can do that while preserving and protecting existing single family. But there's also some single family closer to the urban core that is maybe open to some <laughs> other assignments from the traditional single family model. So there might be those interested in ADUs or corner retail or the occasional duplex or quadplex. So we have a full range set, you know, with the neighbor, it's like, no, we absolutely want to stay strictly single family in this manner. It could be a place type for that. But there's also a place type leading into a more urban set. Well, and I, I just want to plant to see the equity scene. That we hear all the time and time and time again, and these are where we're going to have to have tough discussions. And just to be perfectly frank and put it out there, that we hear time and time from people because you want us to accept additional density, but you're not going to put it in other neighborhoods. So that is something that we have to balance and we have to have a discussion about. It. And that is not at all to say that this is a recommendation or dismantle the single family neighborhoods. At all, this plan is not recommending that. So we do need to figure out where we accommodate more housing and where people can live in the different times. And we have to look at. We are committed to looking at it from an equitable lens. And so, if we're having discussions about the neighborhoods needing to carry the load, we've got to think about. And that's one of the benefits of thinking about this from a citywide perspective and doing a citywide plan 
So you're opening up that lens to say, well, you're recommending this here, but why not here? So I just want to kind of plan that too, that when we're thinking about this, these are difficult questions that I think we, and I, I don't have the answer. I'm just saying, I think this is questions that we need to work through. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. So, piggybacking on that, how do demographics and the changing demographics playing a role in this process? Right. So, as you mentioned uh, before, we even started developing place sites. We looked at kind of the existing condition of the city. Uh, right now, the city made up forty-two percent Hispanic um, in terms of like the demographic of major uh, people who live in the city. If we're thinking about from a major perspective. We need to make sure that the feedback that we're getting is what sites that those demographics. I'm actually talking about age also. Yes. So basically, in terms of aging in place, they think about that too. Um, the different types of places and how they need to kind of transform or maybe maintain. That's also something we're doing. We're, we're making sure we're, we're addressing and talking to uh, engagement, those particular audiences, because right now, um, 30 years from now, being 20 years from now, we're going to add 300,000 people to the city. Um, that's the city of Plain. So I think it's going to have to think about the density and who's actually going to be here um, in that amount of time and how that city is going to get yeah, to those populations going to age in a really good point. How can we kind of have that city in the future adapt to that aging population of that age of the graph that we're looking at? So I think with your question, like, are you thinking about, are you asking, like, the age from in 20 years from now, what we'll be planning for that or right now? Well, when you think about housing stock, right? and again, I'm going to speak from personal experience. My mom was looking in about her single family home right. and she needs to go somewhere. So there are a lot of options, right. but it is interesting that she has not found an option she likes yet. And so to me, that just says, okay, she, that's the baby boomer generation. Right. She is, that is a huge population yeah. of people mm -hmm. that are going to be getting out of single family homes right. because they can't afford it or they just don't have the mobility or the resources to maintain it. Where are they going? Right. And it's not part of, you know, when you look at housing stock, what they're not all going to move to retirement centers. Right. So, where, what are the other options that y'all are contemplating that you can Well, that is 100% one of the matters that you can think of, of types of housing to be provided. That, you know, oftentimes we think of, you know, at default to if we're talking about this in the middle or we're talking about, you know, high rises. We always call that we think that we're thinking, you know, young professionals or young people. But we are also factoring in those who want to age in place in their communities and what type of housing does that look like. Um, and that is a consideration when recommendations are made for different housing types of all of those things. We, we're thinking about the full gamut from birth to, to us leaving this earth. You know, where are people living? Okay, and then I have a couple other questions. So, in, in the square with the bubbles, the big ones that popped out to me were walkability, bikeability. What you said? Each of the place types. How? What type of open space and space do we see in this place? Right? Or do we need more of? Yeah. Um, there's also a big one of many comments about so it's here being connectivity, transferring to development connectivity, and the connectivity piece is also considering trains. And so we have quite a few comments about. How we work the trail system for potential the lack thereof, at least yeah. safe and quality, um, into thinking about this plan and certain place type recommendations or what the place types can say to that. And then just we've got the rural open space, I'm sorry, the regional the open space. Regional open space. Um, so those capture the big areas. Um, Preservation in these spaces. But I mean, is there a goal, you know, when you look at overall land use, that everyone will be 
10 minutes from the green space. Well, so that's the park plan. That is the system park plan. That we need to bring up. Now, the land use can bolster something like that. Is the land use plan, Forward Dallas can say we want to do this, but Forward Dallas can't create that policy. That is a different department's policy, which they absolutely can do. And so we're working with those different departments to say, what do you need us to say at Forward Dallas to help you do your work? So, so some we can say type has in it built in that you know this place type will either have great space or an open space or will be in proximity yes. to those things. Yes. Okay, I got that. Okay. Then the TOD new work we do is not I'm not familiar with this. So why I'm yes. <laughs> so, no, I thought of two websites. I was a transfer to public public. So, <laughs> it could have been a lot of different things to different people. So, um, TOD, though, is transit oriented development. And are we talking not just about DART, but are we, is that also keeping the walkability and the bikeability? Yes. And obviously, some cars. Like, are you looking at all different modes of transportation? Yes, uh, micro mobility as well. Um, well, that was made without kind of transit stuff. So, I think all of that, yes, we want to make sure that we're incorporating a uh, type of development that uh, lends to that type of transportation connectivity through all modes of transit mobility. Okay, what's my problem? I'm so sorry, another term. So, what are you talking about? <laughs> sorry. So, yeah. so, Scooter, oh, I'm sorry. Scooters, bikes, kind of old lady, you know, kind of those in between type of mobility options. <laughs> that gets you some point. Point. You can and these are sort of at, so one of the and I I can't really wrap my head around it, but some cities are now saying you know walking and rolling, but you're not even saying bike. You know, traditionally been saying like right. you know cycling, but but it's like really it's what rolls. At this point, we have skateboards. Well, oh, I know that we were on college for oh, last week, and one of the amazing things because people skateboard all over, and they had these ramps where you could like tie up your skateboard and your scooters. Right. Never seen those before in my life. So, yes, micro mobility. <laughs> <laughs> to connecting. So, so we're so the bike plan is in process. Um, there is a trail plan, there is a park plan. We are hoping to interface with those pieces. And the flight specs can also be a guide for those policies and you know what kind of um, infrastructure to place where. So if this is in this place type, they need this kind of park. But the other piece with land use and like trails or bikes or TOD is that even if you have that infrastructure, the, the land use may actually block you from accessing it. So we want to make sure the design language says that. If you have a trail next to you, then we need to encourage urban design of new developments to relate to the trail rather than block. For instance, exactly. So we're it, a lot of it with lane use is about making sure we can access the existing infrastructure. There are there is a lot of uh, bike infrastructure. There's about to be a lot more locally. There are a lot of trail miles. Um, there are a lot of dark stations and uh, bus modes. But a lot of times, the uh, the urban design and the accessibility of those sites. Uh, really hampers us from actually utilizing even existing infrastructure. Okay, Commissioner Wheelers. So, if some of this at um, the forward Dallas plan, it was based was it not based off of some of the feedback from the area plans that were throughout the city of Dallas uh, over the last two years? Did you all get some of that feedback from those area plans? Yes, uh, absolutely. Those, those yeah, we have um, the benefit of a couple of active area plans right now, and those are directly working in tandem with Forward Dallas. Oh, oh so, and those, and, and uh, if I'm right, those task force were kind of throughout the throughout all districts, and they they were a separate uh, a separate body of community leaders and those in uh, in those areas meeting with the staff. Yeah, there's a separate task force for each of those planning efforts, and then separate community engagement. And those help kind of formulate the ideals of what in in, in um, the land uses and zoning that was requested. 
to those meetings and kind of the feedback that you all got from the community and the tech. Yes, absolutely. Yep, when we went out to the meetings, we actually uploaded the comments from those meetings into the original map. So even when we were, were out at meetings, staff would come back and put that information into our, into our mapping so we would have a, a catalog of comments. And those were kind of like sticky type of notes that people wrote on in different areas. And then exactly. You all. Okay. Yep, exactly. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm on. This is Commissioner Hawk. Would you go back to the um the equity page? I just wanted to look at something that was on there. It went kind of fast. Thank you. So on this page, it mentions outline clear path to integrating smaller area plans. Has that been done yet? Or do we have like a scout? Can we see just where that is? So we're working on that process currently. Um, it's really putting in on paper what the process is. There will be an introduction to this plan. And what's pretty common in comprehensive plans is how the comprehensive plan works with smaller area plans. So neighborhood plans, area plans, potentially a corridor plan. So we will have a description for you to review about how they're integrated. Currently, we don't have anything in text that clearly outlines how different plans relate to one another and what happens when you adopt a new plan. What does that mean to a comprehensive plan? So we want to make sure that that is outlined and that is clear moving forward. Because I think historically, there's been a lot of confusion in that area. What happens when you do a plan? What does it mean for other plans? So we want to make sure that that is very clear moving forward. We don't currently have that text, but we will be producing that. So it, it's it's clear and understandable. Okay, that makes sense. The reason I had the question is just based on the um, West Oak Cliff area plan and some of the feedback that some of the residents gave for um, on various parts of the plan, but I was just curious about that based on um, having observed the experience of people talking about um, how they were engaged during the plan or how they weren't engaged during the plan, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you for that. Sure. Any other questions from our folks online? Commissioner Roach, hold on. Please, Mr. Um, Something that you said about trying to identify the areas of the city where there's a mismatch between the zoning on the ground and the built environment. Do, do you have this capacity or does the record exist to identify the zoning changes that were implemented during the zoning so well over the 80 So that's what a lot of them that yet was introduced. Just and that has been very material and contributed to displacement and designation in West Dallas. I think they point eradicated one neighborhood entirely taking chunks out of our um I don't do we have I don't know how far we go back. It's something that we can look at and where we have it, we can find that. Uh, I know that we've looked into some of sort of the historical sequence of things in other projects. So we can certainly see if we can that data. Oh, that'd be something we were investigating. There wasn't much data, yeah. uh, but we can still continue. I was pretty good in Dallas at that point. Right. It was getting a little by design, right. Right. so I wasn't really the wrong design. Right. But um, it seemed there was a theory at the time that if you have an incompatible lead JSON, so that's what you did to try to buy a buffer. Was there up zone? Or just a residential neighborhood? Or even my residential neighborhood? And it didn't make much difference for. Decades and there's no development going on. Right. 
But you know, when an area becomes hot and then developers decide to say, oh, they're relatively, you know, affordable houses in this local class neighborhood that have THC zoning on them, it's the vibe. Yeah. Definitely. If, if those records exist, we right. that recall. Yeah, we can take a look, we can see what we can find. What? what I forgot was <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, you guys touched on it a little bit you have existing land use plans like the area plans community land use plans whatever they can do for both um, and I hear you saying that there there is no process when you have an area plan object for land to match the area um, and, and, and consequently, I'm bridging to a question. What? Trails. And the trails use. When will, will there, is there a thought to want to include in trail use? Um, you have, you say, walkability and, ride, and rideability. About animal ability mm -hmm. um, that needs to be considered. So as a as a consideration, um, as well as if once you bring that plan, once that those those plans are are adopted and codified, to change so that we, you don't have the mix match. You don't you don't you don't continue the. The mix matching of what's on the ground opposed to what has already been identified as a, as a want and need. And when will there be a plan or a process or, and that will come forward that will take all of these area plans and match match on the land what the communities have said they wanted? Yeah. So. There technically is a process for this. We just haven't necessarily been using it. Using it. Right. And I, I wouldn't say, and, and there is a process. So, right? So, you do a plan, and if there are two things that come out of this plan, there are two things that we can do. We can do land use, we can do, we can do land use plans, and we can do zone. And you're supposed to do, ideally, in a perfect world, you do planning, and then you follow up with the zone. We've done a lot of planning. And we just haven't followed up to the city of Michigan. So we've left it to individual property owners to come in and zone property by property. They follow the plan, they don't follow the plan. So that is part of this plan to have more declarative statements and be more consistent with what we're saying is that if we're recommending something in plan, we need to follow up with the rezoning. And we just need to be, get better about that process. Um, and so that that's partly what our the part of the organization was about, was to put those teams together so that you have the planning and the city of and rezoning together to sort of work hand in hand on some of these issues. We do have to get better. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioners, uh, let's sort of take our first break, just a quick five minute break. It's like coffee at 1039, We're back at uh, 1045. Let's go. I'm D11. Yeah. I'm D11. I'm D11. Yeah, I don't know. 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 I don't Remember? <laughs> and then it's that it's gross. You know, the discussion that you know, the that is something that you have, right? Yes. 
You can interpret the driver and you just think that. You know, we can't just. Yes. 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 Mr. King, do you see anybody online? Any commissioner online? She said, Ready to go out. No? Did you? Are they online? You didn't even try to send it to of scope kind of aligned with what we presented today. So basically this is going to be just an overview of some numbers, an overview of how schools have been handled historically, how they're currently handled in the code, and then just looking ahead towards possible future options and then just working through some issues and comments about the limits versus issues. And the events. Okay, so uh, currently uh, this chart is just going to show you basically where schools are currently permitted. Uh, the code did not historically differentiate between type of school. Um, okay. We're going to figure out if we can turn this slide. Yeah, we're going to Oh, yeah. It's not my hat right now. 
is This here? Yeah, there's there's nothing connected to that projector, guys. What? It's gonna work anyway. I don't know what that TV is coming from, but it's not from this computer. Okay, then we What if it gets disconnected? So we regret it. Just don't let it be unplugged. That break on you. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay on WebEx. Does that work? Yes. <laughs> I think we're going to use just this one. Can we see that? We should find out that I still need some magnifying glass. I'm going to do that's the one. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Oh, you can send it out to us, right? Yes. Yes, it's true. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That's all you have to do. Okay. I think we're Okay. So, um, historically, uh, school uh, the code didn't actually differentiate between type of school, public versus private, or even further, the type of public school charter versus non charter. So, in the before times, which were just basically not available everywhere. Um, and when we, we got to our, our new iteration of the development code, when we started getting this chapter 51, 51A, um, we started requiring um, an SUP for schools virtually everywhere, uh, with a few exceptions. So, if you'll notice, um, public non-charter schools um, in this first column, this orangey kind of color. Um, there are some districts that uh, those public non-charter schools are allowed um, with just an RIR. If there's a residential adjacency, then there'll be an extra type of review that happens at permitting, but there's not actually a zoning case that would be attached to it. Um, and there are a few places that all schools, regardless of type, are actually allowed by right. That would be in the um, infamous institutional overlay that we <laughs> started talking about a while ago. You just gave me the side <laughs> eye right there. So. Okay. Um, also, um, interestingly enough, in all form districts, all schools are permitted by right under the civic building development site. 
Um, but of course, Article 13, the form districts has significant design standards that would be built into the code that would kind of justify that a little bit more um, in those areas. And then also in central area districts, um, public non-charter is allowed by rights. Everywhere else, the code defined method for authorizing schools is an SUP. There we go. Um, moving right ahead. I did too many. I thought I had them done over here. Okay, so just some quick numbers. Um, the, the image is just there because it's colorful and it shows the city. It's not necessarily anything you need to worry about seeing all the detail. Um, it's a map that was taken out of um, off the DISD GIS page. Um, but by the numbers for PDs and SUPs, these have been options in our code just generally for a number of decades. Um, there are currently on the city attorney's website 1,091 planned development districts, um, of which 211 are for schools. Um, currently, we have 2,366 active SUPs, regardless of use. Um, and of those, 259 are for schools. So we actually have more SUPs for schools than we do PDs, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and then, again, just the institutional overlay has also been an option in the code um, for several decades. Nobody's ever heard of it, um, but it's been there since even before 51 and 51A. It's been there for a long time. Um, obviously, when schools were allowed by right, we didn't need an institutional overlay for schools, but there would be other uses that um, were recognized as possibly needing a place um, that they could be allowed that wasn't necessarily um, standard place, hospitals and um, other institutional uses that we might need to have a place for. So we don't have any of those terms. Um, and in talking to uh, the school cases, we had a lot of, obviously a lot of school cases come through recently, because of the bond package, um, the institutional overlay just doesn't work. Um, one, because it's the mechanism for its use is somewhat unclear in the code. There's a lot of question about some, yes, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, soften the language. Um, it's <laughs> somewhat unclear in the code. Um, there's a site plan, you know, portion of it that nobody's really sure who's going to do that site plan, what stage, and there's all sorts of things we'll get into, but it doesn't work for the schools, so nobody's ever bothered to use it, okay. and we're at zero. Okay, so continuing by the numbers, um, uh, there are 220 uh, Dallas ISD schools within Dallas city limits. There also are other ISDs that have schools within the city of Dallas limits, Richardson ISD, Plano ISD. Um, there's a few, um, Carol's in front of yes. So there are there are a few other cities. Highland Park. Park. <laughs> yes. Yes, so there's a number of other ISDs that do have schools um, in the city limits, but it obviously it's not going to be the same number as the ISD. Um, so in the period between uh, December 30th of 2021, and I think, I think I cut this off at um, the end of this past year. So for basically all of 2022, um, we've had approximately 25 DISD zoning change requests um, submitted or applications submitted during that time. That does not include minor amendments and development plans and things like that. It's just the actual, like a full zoning change of some type. Many of the PD. 225. 25, uh, 25, this middle number right here, 25 oh, applications. Um, out of, during that same time period, overall, we received 225 zoning applications. So, okay. um, quite a few of those. Right, so, and to David's point, um, there are um, several school DISD cases um, that are under review by development services that aren't necessarily coming through our office yet um, or at all, depending on what the request is. So 
I think Dan, David has about 50 cases right now, right? 40, okay. Uh, <laughs> 40. Oh, do I need another What percentage of these cases in the United States cases are by right? Because most of the, uh, all the residential zones are cars that they should be. So are we getting some that are in four districts or CR or wherever they put in? Just need the internal review. I mean, I don't, I don't know right now because they wouldn't come to our office. So I'm not really sure about that. That that would be um, something for a little bit more in-depth research, but fair question. So um, I, I also forgot to mention in this middle section here, um, of those 25 We'll zoom in here in a second. Um, of those 25 DISD zoning change requests that we received during that time period, 15 of those uh, were requests for a new PD, um, which would have put us well over the 1100 mark. Um, nine of 25 were to amend an existing, and only one of those was a request for a new SUP. Now, as you all are aware, um, several of those requests for new PDs were amended to be a new SUP because essentially um, the application would work that way. Um, the SUP and the PD tools are very similar in, in what they can accomplish. Um, and we'll get into a little bit later the types of, of things that the schools are coming in and requesting a PD for and kind of, I've, I've tried to cover it during the school cases as they've come up, but We'll talk a little bit about that today um, and how staff is able to um, address those under an SUP instead. Now, let me not lock my screen. Okay, so I will zoom in, I promise. <laughs> um, but we're going to go through what the current zoning tools are for schools under our current code, um, the options that we have available to us right now. So. Um, obviously, waiting for the Zoom. Does that work? Mm -hmm. Zoom? Okay. So obviously, um, the buy right situation, which is not doesn't happen very often. Um, there would be obviously no zoning application required. They would not come through our office, so it would take a piece of um, the process, the development process, out of the picture for the schools coming through, um, and then. Those schools, even if they don't have a zoning application, it's important to understand that they still would be required to have a traffic management plan. It's just that it would be reviewed at permitting rather than as part of the zoning application. So the buy right situation, you're not losing that piece. It will still happen. It just happens at a different time and location. And, and when does this currently exist? Even not in the of this is for the first. And to Commissioner Kirk, this question, we didn't pull permit, so I don't know, we don't know how many we are outside of what comes here. I mean, I made a note, we'll try to find out. It depends how old they are. Yes. 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 So should, that's another piece of the conversation. Yes. So do we want them in IR reading? Yeah. <laughs> 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 right. Okay. <laughs> so, um, the next sort of intense um, method for allowing a school, that going back to the very first chart, um, some of the locations, um, some of the districts that allowed public non-charter schools with just an RAR, which is a residential adjacency review. Um, again, they don't need a zoning application. So they would not come through our office. They would not have the public hearing process. But again, they would have the traffic management plan that would come at permitting and be reviewed by engineering. Um, and then also, if there is a residential adjacency as it's defined in the code, um, the school itself would require an additional layer of review triggered by that residential adjacency. Um, and it's within the distances specified in 51A 4.803. So that additional layer of review is basically, it happens at the time of the permitting application and it is done by the zoning plans examiner. They look at essentially the same things or similar things to what we look at and they will actually create a, um, it's an official document that would be signed by the building official um, and it would specify certain things that might be limited at the school, similar to what we do sometimes in an SUP. Um, if the location of, of um, 
in athletic fields, if we're concerned about the loudspeakers, if we're concerned about lighting, if we're concerned about any of those things, you can write um, language in this residential adjacency review um, approval document that then the school is bound by um, compliance with those same conditions. It's just that it doesn't go through the plan commission and the council. So in these areas where the code feels like we don't really need, um, you know, they're not right next to a single family, they're not right next to, they're, they're a little bit more remote. And so we can just say, if there's a residential adjacency review, let's make sure that we don't need any additional kind of um, provisions in place to protect that element. Is there any notification required to those residential uses? There is not. So remember that an, a residential adjacency review is actually, it's basically an allowed by right situation. So the code says you can put a school here, but there may be additional conditions placed on it. Are they legally binding? I understand. Are they different for schools? Because I always understood that recommendations made by the people who were permitting that calendar or NAR following strong suggested and before that the actions that were compliant that they weren't legally required to. Well, our code, I mean, our code requires the residential adjacency review, and it is a document <laughs> signed and stamped by the building official. So um, my understanding that it is actually required, um, but I, you know, if not. Right, yeah. to prepare, uh, the director can require certain steps that, have, that are legally required. But can't do so if the effect would be to deny the the application. So, so, so I can say move your your drive-through window to the other side. I can't say you can't can't use that use have have that use. Right. So that, that's what I say. It's essentially allowed by rights. So we can't deny you, but we can put additional provisions. So with the RAR, if you have a school that is in a commercial or, or, or area that's not that does not require a residential review, mm -hmm. adjacency review, then they can do this by right. They they can go. They 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 don't. And, and if they come back for. Um, lighting or fields or they don't have to go through planning and they don't have to go through council or CPC? An RAR is a by right. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Allowed. So they would never have to come through CPC, CPC or council. So we're looking at the agricultural district, office districts, retail districts, mixed use, multiple commercial and urban corridor districts where the RAR would be required. No ACs, no RAR. And also keep in mind that all of those, like lights, they are in the code already. So they're, yeah, that's what I know. And they're, they're, not that, that they're not specific to that. They're, they're specific. That, that's just like at, um, applying Article 10. The, the lighting would be, it, because it's in code, they have to follow a set of standards that have already been identified and, and codified in code that says this is the way lighting must go. Unless... Unless it's the done. conditions of the RAR place additional restrictions on those things. So, so there could be additional restrictions placed on, like, I mean, sound and environmental factors, like kind of technically in our <laughs> but we can like, <laughs> place additional restrictions to limit the hours or location <laughs> or whatever. So and that's up to permitting. And that's yeah. up to permitting. Yeah. Okay. Jennifer, I don't want to derail the conversation, but the director has the ability to deny an IRR. So section 4.800 has grounds for denial, and it lists them. Has the city ever enforced them? No. No. Never has the city ever denied an IRR. And they're in section 4.800. It lists it very clearly. Um, and we yeah. just had a meeting last night with several directors and assistant city manager to discuss Doing uh, that for the first time? Um, and, and, and the city attorney's office. Um, I, all I can say is that he has never denied an RAR. Uh, the ground for denial are listed in section 4.800. 4. 
the avenue for the applicant to appeal is 10 days uh, uh, an application to appeal the director's decision at CPC, the City Planning Commission. So if, if, if an RAR is ever denied through 4.800 and within 10 days the applicant can come and say, I want to appeal I that. I disagree with the director's denial. And then at that particular time, then the applicant would then come before CPC on a, okay. on an issue where they appear to four would not be seen or heard by yes. CPC. Correct. And we've had at least one such appeal. Such so, one? We've had at least one such appeal. Oh, uh, for an IR? Uh, yes, it's, uh, we're on Greenville Avenue. So, so yeah. I in the past that it was a, a certain drive-through facility at Preston Center, and I told them I would not be able to help you proceed with permits, but you would have an avenue. So they had a commu communication with the commissioner and council member, and they never heard. Uh, we never heard. <laughs> I also want to add that. The fact when we say when David says, yeah, in Act 12, it was never denied, or it was once or whatever, 1%, that doesn't mean that we don't put restrictions. It means that we work with them exactly. to comply yeah. and to get to the restrictions that we are putting on them. But if they don't want to accept the restrictions. Exactly. Then we will be forced to deny. Uh, exactly. So we've, we've been able to work with applicants and, and getting them to tweak. And, and go beyond the, the minimum standards to maybe um, remove a driveway from a thoroughfare. Um, and they argue and we explain how that will be. Thanks. Are there any questions? It's a mechanism. Yes. Thank you for that information. Okay, so then um, the, the, the current tool that staff has been. Um, uh, trying to steer applicants to, if it's possible, um, would be the specific use permit. Um, obviously, in that case, a zoning application is required. Um, the traffic management plan will have a review prior to the permitting process. So you see those come through um, as part of the zoning application. Um, the SUP does not actually change the underlying zoning classification of the property. So if it's an R75A, um, it's still going to be R75A and we must comply with the provisions for that zoning district. Um, but then similar to an RAR, we're placing um, additional provisions. We can place more restrictive provisions uh, and conditions in the specific use permit. Um, those would happen at uh, CPC and at council. So there's two public hearing process for, for that. Um, and then, like I said, the SUP only allows modified development standards that are more restrictive with a few exceptions. So for schools, for example, the code allows you to set a parking ratio that would be less, uh, less uh, demanding um, or re require less parking than the base code would. Um, and there is also, for example, a, a landscape plan can come through and be approved that doesn't quite comply with Article 10, um, that is a possibility under an SUP as well. So, but not has to be a landscape plan if there's a, it a has, yes, if it has to. Yeah, the code says, yes. And then the has to decide it's reasonable and consistent with Article 10, but it has to be a landscape plan. Yes. Well, so, what you saying with the SUP, then there has to be a landscape plan? Only if you don't comply with it. If, if you deviate from Article, Article 10. 10. Okay, I'm sorry. sorry. Deviation. Okay. But you can't change setbacks then. So if you, you've got an existing school that doesn't comply with the setbacks, they'd have to do a PD. No, no, we're, no I'll get into that. Okay. I will get into that. Yes. I will get into that. I promise. <laughs> um, so, um, I promise. I promise. Like, for, for salivating, I'm, I'm kind of burying the lead here a little bit. I was kind of like making everybody like, really that was on our toes here. Yes. So the institutional overlay is another option in the code that nobody uses. Um, similar to the SUP, it does not change the underlying zoning classification of the property. It places an overlay, um, like a historic overlay, doesn't change. Um, it would be a general zone. Place the overlay on a property. 
DEC approved site plan prior to the release of the permit. Now they could, I mean, we've talked internally about how exactly that might work. And quite frankly, we don't have all the details of that yet. So from staff's perspective, we're still a little fuzzy on how that would work anyway. And so it's not something that we're currently steering applicants to because we don't know enough about it or how it's gonna work um, internally. Plus we have the SUP that does work for us. So basically going to abandon it as an option. No, ma'am, we're not going to abandon it as an option. It's still an option, but it would require further um, review and possible mm -hmm. amendment before it might be useful for mm -hmm. schools. So the way I read the code right now, it's immensely underwritten, and it, it seems to only possibly allow parking the front yard, which would, I mean, as a deviation from, you know, unless they're why yeah. you be looking for that. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's not difficult to figure out when it would apply. Or it, so, so it was written for the hospital district yes. over on the Mary Connors. The individual school that is very limited. Very limited. It's, right. it's, not, it's not, it's not, um, like I said, we started talking about institutional overlays because we had some questions from um, the long range side of planning and urban design about why we weren't using this. And so we looked into it a little bit and, and started exploring options and looking at why are we doing all these PDs and what are the other options? So institutional overlay came up, but uh, but it, it's not ready to be used. At but if a school, if all schools and residential areas require that should be anyway, what would it be said? What would right. you accomplish with the okay. well, we okay, so, so, well, so, well, so one thing that it would accomplish is that you can have, there's a list of uses in that section, right? That would automatically then be allowed in that overlay area and parking could be shared and placed anywhere in that overlay for any of those institutional uses. So it has some freedom in terms of park, sharing parking and combining. The uses uh, that would not be allowed in the underlying zones? Our zone? Do you know residential zoning? Uh, use, any institutional uses that are in that list that's in the institutional overlay section would be allowed in the overlay. Is that, yeah. Um, so then, obviously, the next one, um, the plan development district zoning application is required. CMP um, happens prior to full permitting review. Um, it does change the underlying zoning classification of the property. So it's kind of like a general zoning change. You're going from an R75A district to a plan development district. And so it's no longer R75A, although the ordinance may reference R75A or whatever the underlying zoning district had been. Um, the plan development district allows modified development standards that are more or less restrictive than the base district. So this is where a lot of times we see folks come in and they request a PD because they, for some reason, think that they can't meet the underlying uh, regulations of the underlying zoning district. Um, and that may or may not be the case. Um, so, but anyway, so that's essentially, you can see we're getting um, increasing the complexity here. So now we can go more or less restrictive than the base district. Um, it doesn't have to comply with any of the same regulations that would be required of the property surrounding unless that's the way the code is written. So it's important to understand that when we're doing a plan development district, we're rewriting a new uh, development code every time we do that. And so the issue becomes, if we don't get that right, if we don't do it well, if we leave um, any sort of um, lack of clarity, um, um, we sometimes inadvertently write things that contradict one another. Um, it can be very difficult for the folks at permitting to understand how to apply that ordinance because um, it's unique to the site. So it's not something that they're working with all the time. They're, they're working with R75A or MF2A all the time. There are custom to these standards, but every time we get a review for a plan development district, they have to restudy that code to make sure that they're applying it correctly. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but we're near 1100 and that gets to be a bit, so quite a bit. Very, yeah, because there's some questions online. Please can start out. Okay, so, um, continuing, there are actually more um, current tools in our development code. One of those, and this will address um, 
your question earlier about if they don't currently comply with a setback, do they need a PD? And the answer is no, um, because if, if the school was legally built um, under the regulations in place for that site at the time the school was built, then it's still legal. It's just non-conforming with the current zoning classification. So um, it's not necessary to legalize something that is non-conforming because by definition, something that's non-conforming is legal. It gets to exist there. They don't have to tear it out. Now there are there are there are provisions in the code that um, that, that that talk about um, if and when you might be able to expand that. Um, but a lot of times we're talking about things like steps and handrails and things that. I mean, I I, I don't I don't want to go too far into that, but. Um, there are ways in the code to expand the non-conforming portion, but if you intentionally remove that, um, you lose those non-conforming rights. So what does that mean? If you intentionally remove that, you lose those non-conforming, what does that mean? It means if I demolish it. Okay. I can't go back later and say, oh, I want to put my steps back here because I used to have them here and they were legal. Okay, all right. But how is the law with that dealt with the site plan? So the non-conforming item and then building inspection knows or will eventually figure out that it's not conforming. Well, so um, at permitting, when CCA knows as well, everybody is a new planner. and I worked together in QT for uh, a number of years. So um, at plan review in, in zoning on the other side, um, we researched to make sure that the um, that the piece that is not complying with the code actually was legally constructed at the time that it was constructed, and then we would mark that up and make a note that this is not conforming and legal, and and there you have a documentation of that. If I tear it down and then want to build it back and say, well, it conforms to the site plan, you mm -hmm. will nevertheless say, yeah, but it doesn't conform to the underlying zone. Right, so the zoning has changed now and there are new regulations in place. So if you intentionally, I mean, other than an act of God, or, you know, some disaster removes that, um, if you take it out, you don't get to just say, well, I used it to legal before, so I can go back and do that anytime I want in, in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Just pause for a second. We have a question for you online. Richard yes. Sure, I'll ask that. I mean, I guess I just don't understand, understand why we're going through all of this. I mean, it seems clear to me you can't, can't change the base zoning. You can't hear me? No. no. We need to turn up the volume a little bit. Uh, most of the important stuff. Okay. It's a mailbag speaker. Should be somewhere yeah. here. Okay, let's try it one more time. Does that work? Yeah. Is that better? And that's all. <laughs> okay. Is that working? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. We're all ready for you. Yeah. I, I mean, it seems like we've spent a lot of time talking about various forms of dealing with these requests and. I, I, I'm unclear why. It, it seems to me that we are admitting that institutional overlay isn't going to be something that works for most of these applications. And while an SUP may work in some, you can't change the base zoning, which is what some of these need. So, I mean, why are we spending so much time talking about the various forms of <laughs> tools we have? Just use the tool that makes sense in the particular circumstance and move on. I think we've been asked to do this briefing to have a conversation about all the tools that are available and to explain a little bit more about schools because we do have a bond program and we have a lot of Dallas ISD schools. They have to come to us because per code, they are by SUP. So the first the first thing you do is you weigh in if the SUP, it is what it is. It's the same for any other users by SUP. If an alcohol sales come by SUP, we're not off the chart, tell them, oh, do a PD instead. So that's why we're having this briefing, just to have a conversation knowing that 
we're having so many schools coming one by one for SUPs because that's what the code requires them to do to be SUPs. And then if we're deviating, let's see all the tools that are there and let's see if it warrants the deviation and let's understand better what SUP is and SUP is not. Okay. Well, I just don't see legally how you can do some of the stuff you guys are trying to do with an SUP, but that's not really a question. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Treadway. No, I had a question earlier, but I held it. Yeah, I think no, she's going to go through that. Yes. Oh, okay. You want? You have it. Speak on. Okay. All right. <laughs> Okay, so the, the non-conforming uh, issue is, it actually happens to be um, a lot of the reason that some of the schools currently request a PD. So a lot, of, a lot of times we get the same conditions in where it talks about steps and handrails and, and things like that um, are, are allowed to encroach into the front yard setback. But these are things that already exist. So like I said, we don't need to legalize those. Um, it's not really a justification for a plan development district because they're already legal and they can keep those things. Now, if they were to take it out and demolish the school, um, then rebuild a new one, they have to comply with the regulations that are in place currently. Um, another option, um, our code um, specifies that the appropriate place to deal with um, some of the issues that we see coming in for schools, things like um, Parking in a front yard setback, um, fence heights, uh, you know, six foot fence in a front yard, things like that um, can be dealt with through the board of adjustment process. Um, you don't need a zoning application for that. Um, but this is this is something that we see a recurring uh, recurring reasons for um, a requested PD from schools are really things that could be dealt with um, at the board of adjustment. This is really fun. Visibility drawing, yes. Um, and then what, what we actually find a lot of is that one of the most important zoning tools that we currently have is a correct application and understanding of the existing development code, which is really hard to understand. It's like, um, it's not really rocket science, but it kind of feels like it. There's so many different places that you have to look that are, are gonna be applicable to um, a certain use or a certain district that it's easy for someone to miss some of the provisions if um, if they're not accustomed to dealing with our development code all the time. So this is an area where staff um, needs to assist the applicants to help them understand um, that actually the thing that they think they can't do on their site, they actually really are allowed to do on their site. So um, for example, um, we've talked about this at a number of the school cases. Um, the special height provisions for institutional uses, a lot of times schools come in because they want to go above the district height. Well, as we discussed, they can do that because of the institutional use that allows them to go to additional heights um, as long as they comply with FAA regulations and, but it is. But, but you, you're saying that the institutional overlay is not ready to be used by school. Why are you picking out some of the institutional rights and saying that, or am I misunderstding what you're saying? Let me, let me distinguish between the two. Institutional overlay is a different zoning tool um, that is a way to authorize the school. Period, full stop, end of sentence. Now, there are separate from that um, provisions in our code that apply to institutional uses as they're, if you go to the institutional district and you see all the uses that are allowed in the institutional district and where else? So, no, so no, no, X, no, wait, 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 let me stop that. Let, let me stop that. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I may make this so simple. Are you using the word institutional in two different yes. means? Okay, yes. that's all I can do. So <laughs> anything, anything that is classified as by our code as an institutional use gets these provisions that are shown here, regardless of if they're in an institutional overlay or not. These are just things that apply to institutional uses. They get special height um, privileges um, and then the RPS does not apply to schools 
um, in the low density residential areas. They get additional lot coverage. So in like in R75A, <clears throat> a non-residential use is shown to be, you know, a massive 25% lot coverage. When in reality, they actually are allowed 60% because they're an institutional use, but that's in a different section of the code that maybe somebody didn't know to go look at. So, um, and then non-conforming rights, as I said, don't need legalization. So these are things that as we've had school applicants come in, that we've had these conversations and have been able to explain, you know, here's what you're asking for, but you actually can already do this. You really don't need a PD for this. Yes, ma'am. Okay. This is a big issue for me because it seems to me, I, I know that the, the staff has said that these rights have always existed in the code, and I, I'll believe that. But that is not, that is a 180 from the way that neighbors understand it and the way that we have been treating cases. I mean, I think about the replacement of the elementary school that was destroyed by the tornado. And, uh, you know, not coverage for one issue, but then we were paying careful attention to residential proximity and slope and the heights. And it's my understanding is that Mr. Young has explained to me it was that the whole reason that residential proximity and slope was initiated in the first place is when a particular church, which is, a, which is an institutional use, wanted to build some massive steeple or something in the middle of a residential neighborhood and that caused so much. So it seems to me what I've heard the version of what the extent was. Um, that, that may be, I, I really, I'm not sure I even know how to address that because I don't know the history of the church and the steeple and all that, that particular case. I, I just know that um, uh, from, from my experience with the city and in applying the zoning code for a number of years, it's been my understanding consistently throughout that in these low, low density um, residential areas, these these are not, RPS is not a, a height limiting factor in those low, low density areas. And that's listed in the district regulations for the R district and the D district and the TH district. So since it's not calling that out, um, it, I mean, it, it doesn't, basically <clears throat> RPS is not gonna apply there. Otherwise you'd never be able to build anything over 26 feet in height. And yet those districts, what's that? Yeah, no setback. Well, but right, I mean, single yeah, family to a single family. family. Generated by the district, right. not by the property line. But, I know what you're saying, though, is that that's not been the way it's been understood and negotiated. And it's, and it's going, and I, 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 since we have these conversations, I have been having this conversation with just people in the neighborhood and saying, this is what the staff is saying now about you know, schools and churches and neighborhoods. And they're, I mean, their heads spin like in the exorcist. So, yeah, yes, and we would do a development code amendment. Yeah. If three of us signed the memo, oh, whatever. Yeah. Well, so, so to address that, at any rate, um, if if that is a concern, as as some sometimes has started to happen when we come through with the SUPs, if it is a concern and and, and the commission does want to put an extra height restriction on, you certainly have the authority to do that, even in an SUP. So, if there is a concern. You can limit the height to whatever you need to limit it to because just because the code says that an institutional use let's just pretend that we look, that we all agree you can build it to however high just because it says that doesn't mean that you can't limit it using the sup tool so other institutional uses that don't they don't require it right yeah so we I mean, that would be a permitting question. So, I mean, I, I don't even. If that's the way staff is interpreting the rules for high for institution use, it looks like you back to square one of the allowing students. And I also wanted to point out that under the church use in the code, there's a provision that says the following structures, when located on top of a church building, <coughs> are excluded from the height measurement of the building. And it says bell fries, bell towers, campanils. Carillions, crosses, cupolas, spires, and steeples. So RPS doesn't apply to church. On top of that, they have unlimited height for the steeple. But this is why it's listed under this category because it, it, because the the common understanding of some of the provisions in our code, we definitely understand um, that there's. There is a misunderstanding. I mean, it's hard to read our code. It's hard to interpret our code. It's it's a bear. <laughs> so 
Um, so most people coming in would think the same as the neighbors that you've been talking to and think that this does apply, thinking they need a special provision like a, a plan development district would allow. And in reality, they don't. But then we know if we bring them through the uh, public hearing process, um, if there is concern about height of that location, then commission and council will have the tool available to say, well, careful, you don't get to go any higher than this. And when you said the tool would mean the SUP site plan would cap the height, right? Well, so we wouldn't necessarily put it on the site plan. We would codify it in the conditions. Okay. But yes, essentially, we would just write that as a condition and say that the, so uh, some of the ones that just came through, we had at the, the horseshoe, um, we had, for, you know, the, the motion included a height limit. And so then that gets written in as part of the conditions of the SUP. And there you have it. It's done. Okay. Commissioner Young, followed by Commissioner Hanson. I have about an hour's worth on the subject of the RPS for institutional height mm -hmm. limits, but we'll do that another time. Suffice it to say, I think there's a misunderstanding, but it's on the part of building inspection. Okay. Very, very, very fine. My, my question is, this approach provides absolutely no height protection for surrounding properties. But, but, but the public hearing process. There's a public hearing process on, on, on this program. The correct application and understanding of the existing development area. Well, but this doesn't say that a school is all of a sudden allowed by rights. I mean, this is right. saying this is just saying that you don't necessarily need a PD for that, but you can do no. an SVP. No, but you're saying many of these cases can be short stopped and not involve a zoning application if the applicant understands the existing development curve. No, what I'm saying is that they can be they can be accomplished with a, a specific use permit rather than needing. No, it. That's further up your slide. No, this is a by rights option. Yeah, but you know, by right option, you can be sure you have the RPS applied because it's an IR. So then your R's is going to generate the R. No, as I understand it, no you're saying in R75, many school applications don't really need to be there because the non conforming rights can be accommodated and you have special provisions for institutional height. No, let me no. clarify because because if yeah, because if they if they if they're already built and they're not changing anything, they wouldn't come to permitting, they wouldn't come to us, they wouldn't do anything. But if the school decides I want to build an addition or I want to do something, and they were built during the time that schools were allowed by rights, then they come and they need to make a change, they have to come up to the current code, which requires an SUP and 75A. Well, when would this last bullet point apply where no zoning application is required? No PCs. I apologize. Now I understand where the confusion is. So, okay, ignore that top line. I should not have put that in there because it obviously misled you. Um, this is not meant to be for the buy right case where they wouldn't come through. This, to clarify, this is a situation that says because you want to go above the district height, you don't need a planned development district to do that. We can we can accomplish this with a specific use permit. Um, and then that also has to come through the zoning change process, and then the commission or council can put the height limit. But so there, there would be at least a few cases where you could come in and deal with this strictly at permitting, I'm not increasing the degree of nonconformity. All I'm doing is renovating the cafeteria. Well, yes, I mean, an, an interior remodel. Is wouldn't require a zoning change. I mean, but that any expansion of the building envelope. Yes. Yes. Whether it encroached and setbacks or not. Regardless. Yes. Mr. Hampton, Mr. Yes. Mr. Thank you for asking that because I I kind of like important clarification. That is a very important clarification, and I will take this out of my slides, but <laughs> not to confuse. Um, okay. So, yes, so two follow up questions on height. And I think, you know, appreciate, you know, reading the exception on spires and steeples and other uh, components that would be allowed for limited height. Aren't there typically a smaller footprint than, for instance, an auditorium, which would seem more contiguous to a worship space because a larger footprint, a larger volume? And so there seems to me to be a disconnect between. What may be the intent of that provision was capturing versus how that would potentially be applied 
apply to a school, for instance? So, so yes, they definitely would have a bigger footprint. I mean, a school versus, well, I don't know, there's some. I'm talking in terms of what the but yes. building or you know, overall structure. But so then the question becomes so if, I mean, if, if you're concerned about the height of a school and you want to be able to limit that, um, the, the point, I guess, that we're trying to make is that you can do that with a specific use, of, use permit just as easily as you can do that with a plan development district uh, ordinance. That's my follow-up question. Yes, because we've had numerous discussions about setbacks and how those could be applicable mm -hmm. and that we could increase but not reduce whatever the minimum was. But if we're also saying that the height is unlimited for these uses, how do you then say Oh, but on height, we can actually limit it. That seems to be an inverse. Yeah, because it's no. more restrictive. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the difference between being more restrictive or being more permissive. So if you can go to any height normally, but the SUP it's says you can less. restrict it, so now all of a sudden, instead of going to 100 feet, you can go to And for setbacks, you cannot be more permissive all because you don't have to. You can't reduce it, but you can increase it. Right. Because that's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Try right. Okay, so I'm going to piggyback on the setback question because when I asked earlier, um, I thought you said you if you do the SUP, you don't necessarily have to comply with the setbacks of the underlying zoning class. Zoning you must. You must. You must. Okay, so then if you have an existing building, it's a non conform it's a legal nonconformity because it was built before the zoning classification changed. You can keep that setback, whatever it was, because for that piece, for that piece, not for the new. And I thought I heard you say yeah. you can extend or expand that non-conforming use. Um, th there are certain provisions in the code that di dictate how and when that can happen, but generally speaking, you're not going to be able to come build in addition to the school and then also have that reduced setback. That's not the type of thing that we're talking about. Okay, what are we talking about? How would you expand a non-conforming use? Because that kind of blows my head. Like, I'm not really sure how that would work. Right. We're not, but you wouldn't, it wouldn't be a non -conforming, like, I don't know how that would be possible. Like, how would you expand a non-conforming use structural piece and try their non-conforming use? So we have two things in the code. One is non-conforming use, and the other one is non-conforming is to the development standards, a non-conforming structure. So you don't expect, it's not becoming more of a school, but it's becoming more of the whatever setback is. So you cannot increase the non-conformity to the setback. You have to come with the new addition to the required setback. Okay, so non-conforming use structure. versus non-conforming structure. Right. Okay, so I've got a setback that doesn't come because it, it was built before the zone. So mm -hmm. let's just say 20 and 10, some better with numbers. So I have a 10 foot setback in the school, and the zoning classification now requires a 20 foot setback. Mm -hmm. Is there any way I can build a ramp or do anything else that continues that 10 foot setback? Or is the only way I can get permission to do something to continue it under the Board of Adjustment policy? You would have to go through some public process to be allowed to make that happen. But can I jump through Board of Adjustment and not come back to CBC? Um, I believe so, yes. I want to clarify something about yeah. BDA in just a second. So, and I think this is important. One, SUP is required by code. BD is an elective option, and BDA, you have to meet a hardship, and the hardship cannot be self-imposed, which is what we're trying to say. Okay, you want a BD, but tell me, why do you want it? Is it just because you want it? It's a difference between wants, needs, limitations, impossibility to meet the code. So, yes, at BDA, you have to prove the impossibility to meet the code. And that's kind of like what we're, the conversation we're having in here. It's not like, oh, I choose to go to BDA or I choose to do the PD. It's, you have to prove something at BDA. It's a, a variance has to come. You have to convince, right? That's why BDA is a quasi-judicial board and they make these decisions. Okay, so then when we talk about all of these PDs versus SUPs, I have a real concern with doing an SUP with a limited time frame for a mm -hmm. school. That is my primary concern because a PD does not have a time frame. Right. So is there, and I'm a big fan of forms, so is there not a way to develop an SUP form for schools that has like 
no time frame, or conversely, can you develop a PD form for schools so that you don't have to reinvent <laughs> each time? Okay. Good question. I, can I answer that? Of that is exactly what I'm thinking. Thank you very much for asking this question. Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> Because this is a lot of brain damage that feels like it can so, 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 but, but so, <clears throat> the we got into this because our code is mm, difficult. There's a big code amendment coming, um, and there's there there are a lot of things that could benefit schools through a code amendment. So, this is probably where this is going. We don't know if it's institutional overlay. We don't know if it's just you know, the use, the, the use regulations for the school with lots of design standards. We don't know what it is, but exactly what you're talking about is what we've been working towards as through this bond program, as we've worked with these schools, if you notice the SUP conditions are starting to be very standardized, right? That's the idea is that we talk to schools and we say, what is it that you need? How can we accomplish it? Can we get a standardized sort of format? And then can that be codified just generally? So, Maybe they don't have to come here as often or for for the yeah. same, but just, you know, maybe it's if it's in our code already that they have to meet these certain provisions. And I mean, we couldn't make that code amendment without going through the public hearing process, obviously. So we're not trying to do an end around on that, but yes is the answer to your question. I would also like to add that I don't think there's anywhere in the code and now I need to go and check. You don't have to have a time limit on the SUP. You may if you want. To. Right. So you may erect to say permanent, which is what we've been doing. And if it is like we pulled a lot of data, we sent you two tables this morning. We saw I got it. Exactly. You'll see. And this is the slide. Like I looked last night out of thirty-two SUPs that we have for public schools, twenty-seven of them are permanent already up to a point and then we started to change them to PD. So I found ordinances last night, it was, it used to be an SUP and when they came because they wanted to change the site plan, we made them create a new PD. So I'm like, what are, what, what's going on? Because they were well, they didn't touch the permit and they just needed an, an, a little tweak to the site plan. And then I found a lot of SUPs where we just tweaked the site plan and left their permanent time alone. So. You, you may put a time frame via the SUP, but you don't have to. Right. So, and that goes, that gets us nicely into this transition of the time frame of when these things were happening. Um, as we were kind of talking internally prior to the briefing, um, there's a clear um, time period where we started shifting from using SUPs for schools so using PDs for schools, and that happened in the early 2000s, right? So prior to that, like I have three case files here right now, two from 1986, one from 1995. SUP for schools, permanent time period. The conditions actually are very similar to what we're doing now, except back then they didn't have traffic management plans and traffic studies that were part of it. So at some point in the 2000s, those started getting added but that was a lot of the reason for the shift to plan development districts back then is because there was concern about traffic and things like that. So some of these things, again, we can accomplish it through an SUP and already are accomplishing it through an SUP. Um, but yes, I see you. Well, one of the things sure. that the, the, moved the uh, P driven by committee uh, conditions that were being imposed on schools outside the city. Uh, Disability layups, you know, new student kinds of signage or um, security fences, you know, that sort of thing. And to me, that these are things that you know, that could be more. It, it seems like we've all this fairly standard set of exceptions that have driven us to PDs in schools. That these could be addressed through a, you know, code that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely true. The code, the way we do zoning has to change because in the 60s, when we started with the zoning the way we see right now, we didn't have the building codes that we have right now. We didn't have ADA. We didn't have a lot of federal laws or state laws or regulations that we have right now. So obviously, that's why the code is obsolete and you will have, there are provisions that are now in the fire code, but they're still in the zoning code. And if you put them together, it don't make sense. And those are the interpretations that you surely have to, are the hard ones that permit it. One of the struggles I'm having is one the reason it's been explained to us to, to go to the SUPs is it's faster. Uh, <laughs> but if we're having to send 
cases, I mean, I'll, this little girl, I have to go to the Board of Adjustment. Is that faster for her? Than for me? Right. No. It, I would say that uh, it's faster. I, I will say this again. I'm sorry I have to say it. It doesn't, and we've been heard that. We don't, when we say we want, want to make things easier, it doesn't mean that we're lazy. We don't want to do our jobs. Mm -hmm. We love our jobs. Okay? We, we want to do as many SUPs and PDs and code amendments as possible. We're saying, are we adding unnecessary hurdles to the applicant at her name? Mm -hmm. And their time frame, instead of being, I know I want to build this school or increase this school right now, is it three months or is it two years? And they need to have that certainty. And is it two years because you must, you have a limitation, or is it because we choose to put you through another year? That, I think, has the professional judgment that we have to make. The code already says an SUP. Can you accomplish it with an SUP? That's the faster. And then you go at permitting, and at permitting, they look at code, they see the SUP, it's easier to review versus a PD where you have to, like, nitpick every word and see, okay, does it change, does it? I'll just go ahead and ask my big question now. Um, the first school that's going to be in a, a very important institution that's in the neighborhood has a tremendous effect on it's going to be there for 50 years, 100 years, forever, whatever, longer than you're going to be here. Are we sacrificing optimal site configuration or to, to go through this SUP? Uh, I don't think so because the SUP complies with code. We have to keep in mind that we have code. <laughs> Okay, so we get into the and we can make it more restrictive. Front yards so side, you know, the way they determine where the front yards and the side yards are for a you know, a lot. I mean, it seems to me those rules make sense for a residential home, but you know, should the side yard setback be the long side where all the the, you know, the neighbors are facing it, and, and are we driving? Like we had the Geneva High School and Commissioner Kingston's district, where we ended up we stayed with the PD. Or we, Sorry, I don't know if we added one or we extended, I don't remember anymore. Yeah. But you know, the existing parking had already always been on the till, the busiest street, which, yeah. you know. And if we were going to try to impose the SUP conditions, you know, the parking would have to be somewhere else and be driving the traffic to the neighborhood streets. It just seems that that's my big struggle with the SUP versus the PD is that yeah. I want to see an optimal site configuration that includes the athletic, whatever. Because we've got one, one chance to get it right. If it takes more time to get it right the first time, that's my, my bias. That's why I am. I understand it still goes back to you. We still have the segment that illustrates it. And we have made a judgment based on this, on our exhibit. It's the same for PD. It's just that I think the only big difference is like we have a set of standardized conditions and you default to the code for some, but you can be more restrictive in, a, in an SUP. And then when it comes to a PD is, do we want to add a lot of language or do we want to, again, it's for the exhibit, it's like, but are we tying ourselves into press and us? With respect to Geneva Heights specifically, um, the justification for that was, was the, the protection of the, the original 1931 building, which was the, the part of it that we couldn't accomplish through an SUP. And so it justified a PD to protect that building. Get a more restrictive condition to make them better retain the facade. You can't do that. I'm going to, no. <laughs> that's, that was, that was, that was, that was, that was, that was, no, definitely not. That, that's, that's something that we, we can't, we don't do that through a so, SUP. So, so anything that wants to protect part of the legacy building would require a PD. We would recommend this way. Well, we'll look at all the tools and we'll see, okay, well, how can you accomplish that? Commissioner Rubin. Yeah, just, just to follow up on that, um, staff's not saying universally SUPs are needed for public non charter schools, right? There may be cases where the PD is justified in a case like this. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. I heard earlier some angst about sort of how the heights for institutional uses in, in single family areas and how that interacts with non-conformities. So I wanna walk through a couple hypotheticals just to make sure that I, I understand. Let's just say we have a school that was built for, you know, under earlier code with different setbacks, but without an SUP, but now it encroaches into a setback. Mm -hmm. But the school is 25 feet tall and DISD wants to put a second story into that school. Mm -hmm. Would that require the school to come back for an SUP? 
They they would have to, yes. To it, increase it, the height? Yes. Okay. So if, I mean, essentially when, when you want to place an addition on a school, anything like that, anything other than an interior remodel, okay. essentially, yes. And so also to, if I may, um, if, if the building itself is non-conforming with respect to that setback, you're not going to be able to put that second story in that setback. So that second story will have to comply with the setback that is currently in place. Make sense? Okay. Yeah, that makes total sense. And one other slight variation on that theme, okay. let's just say you have a school that is built before SUPs were required. Half of it was two stories, half of it's one story. Mm -hmm. And you wanted to add on the second story to that other half of it, have to come back for an SUP, right? That is my understanding, okay. yes. Great. Finally, we've talked about the time it takes to get an SUP through the process versus the time it takes to get a PD through the process. This is kind of a broad question, but can you give me an idea of, of what efficiencies time-wise might be gained from the SUP process versus the PD process? Um, one, just at, at our stage in the process, um, because we're working towards um, a set of standard conditions, but then we do tweak and adjust, you know, for each specific site. Um, um, it takes out one of the one of the steps that staff generally has, which is sending conditions ahead to the city attorney's office to have them review this and say, well, you can do this, you can do this, because we've already had those conditions vetted and we're tweaking minor things. It's a quick phone call or an email or something that says, hey, can I add this to it? Yeah, that's good. Okay, great. And then that piece is out of it. Whereas if you go to if you're talking about writing PD conditions, remember you're rewriting a development code for that site. So it's it's more intense of a review. You have to be very careful with the language and making sure everything gets covered, making sure you're not building um, contradictions into the code. It's just a longer, more intense process at our stage, even just for getting the zoning through. Then when you go to permitting. The interpretation of that is similar, similarly um, lengthened just because the, the permitting staff doesn't, doesn't deal with PD 1087, you know, 27 different times in a week because it's just 1087 for this little location that somebody may never have. When I, when I was doing plan review, there was not a week that went by that I wasn't reading a new ordinance that I had never seen before. So every time I'm reading that, I'm learning the ordinance and making sure I understand how it applies, what parts of it go back to the develop the base development code, what parts are handled here. If there appears to be a conflict between the two, but this is how just how do you you're learning a new code every time. So it's a longer review process at permitting. Whereas um, my former colleagues over in permitting um, have more than once called and thanked us for another SUP for the school because it's so much easier to review for them because they know the base code. They deal with MF2A or R75A on a daily basis. These are not new ordinances that they're learning all the time. They already know these ordinances. Yes, they'll refer to the code to make sure, but, but the interpretation is already there. Those have been established long ago. It's not, it's not revisiting and reinventing the wheel every time. So just, I guess that would be the major way that I would see it shortening the process. Thank you so much. Yes, so just one follow up on the comment about following the code when you need to start with the SUPs. Well, not surprise you that my comment is regarding setbacks in block phase. It will not. <laughs> so, so well, you know, Commissioner Carpenter mentioned to me my height, but I actually took the opportunity to go through four of the school sample. Um, in addition to just general or versus this. Mm -hmm. I have not found one today that is not more centrally located on a whole block as a part of the park or otherwise accessible. It's setback is not the minimum. It's setback responds to what we would all think of as being the front yard setback. Generally, we're on all sides. So when we say that we default to code, I think the concern of mine is, and to Commissioner Carpenter's point, how are we achieving the best site organization for schools that are there for 100 years and that honor that sort of form within the communities? Well, base code speaks to that a lot as well, as you mentioned earlier. So 
So, so now it's staff evaluating that. So, so that that's part of, I guess, um, the, the angst seems to be that we don't have a way to automatically ensure that that's going to be required right now for a school. I mean, but it doesn't mean. I, I'm not sure that a, I'm not sure how a PD would be a better tool than an SUP to ensure that setback because you can increase that setback under either tool. Right. So if we want to, I, well, I think what I heard you say though is that the one of the approaches with the SUP is that oh we follow we default to code and I'm saying I think right. we talked about my concern is I don't think that the language is there in the code as I had traditionally understood. But but, but, it, a PD, but again, you're starting by looking at it. right. But but again, with an SUP, it's not that you can't put the provision in. It's that you don't have to write the rest of the code just to be able to get the setback. You have the code built in, and then you establish a condition that says the setback at this street is 25 feet, the setback at this street is 25 feet, setback at this street is 25 feet, and setback at this is 25 feet, period, end of story. You put that into the SUP, but you don't have to write the entire development code for that site just in order to get that provision. And that's great. And so that is an opportunity. Yes. Then how staff, as you are evaluating that, is that one of the things that you are evaluating if we end up with a form on what these may or may not be? I don't think we're at the place where we're at ZOAC yet, but that would obviously be something that we would have to answer to you all about at that point. Uh, so that would be the intent of this, is that it would end up, I'm not going to use this very globally, but it would be a code amendment that would then establish whatever our base parameters would be. Whatever the base parameters. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. 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 Chair. Okay. We're running short on time, but how many more slides do we have? Oh. I, I can, I mean, I can keep yes. going or not. No, oh, please. But yes. I, I hear comments. I have lots of questions about Oh, but yeah, this is so this is just the first round. Two, I'm sure there will be. Yes. Want to, I was to add other, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We were going to ask that if we want a part two, we can. So, yes. Yeah, yes. Yes. yeah, this is super helpful. Okay, yeah. so then let's just do that. Let's just okay, put, so we we'll bring it back down. maybe bring the next okay. time on the 20th, if not the, okay. the, the following we'll meeting. Continue from the yes. Uh, Thank you. You're very welcome. I'm so glad yeah. to be able to actually have the conversation. So, and I really appreciate all the questions because it definitely helps us understand. Where the sure. We will just brief the zoning cases before we hear them. Uh, it is 12 11. Let's grab our lunch. That concludes the briefing of the Boundary Plan Commission. We can report you at 12 30. Stop being <laughs>